Saludos, Jin Dobre, and good morning. Hello, my liberty loving amigos. Today, our guest is Federico Fernandez, Senior Research Fellow of Austrian Economic Center in Vienna, that's in Austria, and Vice President of Fundación Bases in Rosario, that's in Argentina. We've met in a small cafe in Warsaw, that's Poland, and talked about free market roadshow events that Federico is co organizing. Donald Trump's taxation policy, hopes for a brighter future of Europe, recent situation in Latin America, including the numerous collapses of socialist governments, the similarities between two popes, the one from Poland and the one from Argentina, and also Federico's struggle to educate his fellow Argentinos about the reality behind the Che Guevara fairy sherry tale. And this is how it sounded like. Hello Federico, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you, the pleasure is all mine, thank you for having me. Is it your first time in Poland? I mean, not, not my first time, uh, but I mean, it's been a couple of weeks that I'm living here. But I've been to Warsaw and Gdansk basically for work a few times, you know, in the past, so I more or less know, know the country already, knew the country already. And what is the reason for your stay in Poland? <laughs> well, because of two things. Uh, my, my girlfriend lives here, that's a very, you know, important reason. Yeah. Uh, usually, the, uh, that is the, correct it, answer. It's the ultimate <laughs> reason. Uh, and yeah, the other thing is that I've been living in, in, in Europe for more than four years now. I was based in Vienna, working for the Austrian Economic Center. I also belong to a foundation in Argentina named Bases. Um, and this year, my, my plan is to be some time in Europe and some time in Argentina coming back and forth. So let's move to Vienna for a moment. Um, you work there with Barbara Kohl and you're organizing the free market roadshow. Yes. Could you tell us something more about this idea? Well, the roadshow is, uh, of course, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat biased, but the roadshow is a fantastic event. We, this will be the 11th edition. I have participated in the last fourth, in the last four. It's a the event is growing a lot. It's it's creating a European network of think tanks, universities, and individuals that support free market ideas. You know, limited government. You know, the the, the, the individual responsibility. This year we are visiting 40 cities in total. We are going to we are going to do, for instance, seven in Spain, five in Greece. It's fantastic. We are doing one. Of course, we are, we come always to to Warsaw. We cooperate with four among other institutions here in, in in the city, and it's a it's a really great event. We team up with institutions all across Europe, and we bring speakers from the U.S., from Latin America, and of course from from the whole of Europe, and. It's really a fantastic uh, opportunity for people who want to know more about these ideas, who maybe you know are not uh, that much aware of libertarianism in general, and for people who are really part of our tradition. Because for both groups, there's there's things that they can take, you know, from the from the roadshow. The Free Market Roadshow is like openly libertarian uh, event. Yeah, I would consider that. In fact, on our website, you know, the, the, our motto is libertarian solutions to today's problems. So, yeah, yeah, it is. But, of course, you know, it's, 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 we, are, we try to be very, very open for people who tend to agree with us. So, you know, we invite and we, and we, and we cooperate with more conservative institutions, with more classical liberal institutions, and with people who agree with our with our basic principles we, we want to know the individual to have more uh, autonomy over over uh, his or her decisions and you know we want governments to be more limited and we want to you know of course state budgets to go lower way lower so if you are on board with that you know you have a place on the road <laughs> i'm on board with that for the last seven years basically i'm just i'm just getting frustrated that um, it's, we're not getting there somehow uh, there, there, are ex there are exceptions and for instance one of the things that makes me more optimistic about the, the roadshow, events like the roadshow is that you can see how the network in Europe is growing and I think in that sense the, the roadshow plays a, an essential part and I'm very happy to, to be part of the Austrian Economic Center in that regard but you can really see how the events in all the cities are growing, get more attention, more people come, more media attention. 
we, we team up with many institutions, you can see how these institutions in, in different cities are growing. So I think in, in that regard, there's plenty to be optimistic. And even in Europe, Europe, you know, and, uh, you know, unlike what the European Union, in many in many senses, you know, tries to impose, Europe is still very, very diverse. And there's also lots of diversities in, in the economic trajectories of different countries. And for instance, Poland has a thriving economy, particularly if you compare it with France or countries like that or Greece. Ireland and Estonia are some of the most, you know, liberal, classical liberal countries in the world, at least economically. Lithuania is doing well too. Now we have to see what will happen in, in Austria if they will be able to pass some, some free market reforms that the country desperately needs. So there's, you know, there are different, uh, you know, tales to, to, be ta to, to be told, you know, in, in a way. It's not, only, it's not only a road of centralization and more taxes. There's plenty of, 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 of places in Europe that are thriving and those places are the ones that are more economically free. And how about America? Uh, have you been listening to the last State of the Union address of Donald Trump, especially the first part, which was about um, economy? The first part was mainly about lower taxation, you know, the, the, the yes. tax cut plan. And I really liked that part. I must tell you that for the first 10 minutes we were like, come on, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the other part was like, let's rebuild the atomic, you know, <laughs> power and let's bring back the Soviet uh, Union again and, and the Cold War which was like not from my um, um, perspective I was not very positive about it but basically <laughs> the first part about cutting taxes and and, and, and you know rehiring people and, and, and bringing back jobs to America that was that was I mean quite impressive I must say last week was uh, Dan Mitchell in Vienna I was there too I had the privilege to introduce him he gave a talk about the Trump tax reform And yeah, he was, you know, he, he's, he's critic of Trump in many ways, you know, and in others he really says that we don't know what he will be up to because he's uh, like a wild card Nobody in many... <laughs> But uh, the, the, what, what he's doing in taxis seems to be very good and it's basically, um, if I understood correctly what Dan said, is he, got, he, he did the most he could do because they, did, yeah. they, they don't have the numbers to make an, an even bigger uh, tax reform. But what they did, it's really, and, and it clearly will have an impact on, on the economy. The, the big question, even, for instance, Arthur Laffer wrote a couple of months ago in the, on the Financial Times that the economy of the U.S., it's very likely and probable that the economy of the U.S. will be growing close to 5% for several years, thanks to this. The very big question, Mark, is that, you know, It's fantastic that taxes uh, go down. Taxes should always go down, but the, 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 the problem is that you know spending, government spending, spending is not going down at all, and the deficit will you know increase even. Exactly. It, it will become even bigger than it, what it is now, and and, and that is you know, is a very big question mark for the future. Uh, that there, was, there was this petition in 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 the United States like last week. They are uh, trying to um, push the reform of, of food stamps. To give food stamps to dogs as well. That's yeah, that's <laughs> insane. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. do you feel, what, what do you think about it? Because yeah. we are, you know, there's three of us right here, and yeah, there's well, a little friend under the table. It's a, with us is Alfonso, my dog, a fox terrier. Maybe he gets some food stamps. I, I'll see if I can <laughs> trade them for something more more positive. I, I'll, I'll feed him already. So you know, because poor people also have to uh, give um, food and feed their dogs. Yeah. So that's the idea. And yeah, it's like you know, my heart is bleeding already. No, that's. I mean, those are the things that are very, very bad, you know, because we are we, we are tending to forget, and unfortunately, you know, in, in 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 Europe and in the U.S., you can see how these many of these countries, you know, are victims or of their own success, and you know, they have become too complacent now, and they really think that you know, being wealth is you know, like a given state, and you know, you can do whatever you want, and you can start you know, handing food stamps or subsidies to dogs, cats, canaries, and whatever you and you name it, and that won't have consequences, but consequences always come, and. 
you know, the countries in Europe that are rich and the countries that are growing fast now and the US and Canada, they are rich because they applied free market, you know, policies. Uh, and now they have, the, they can give, you know, they, the, themselves the luxury of, you know, big welfare states, but they won't last. And Europe, unfortunately, has many, you know, dark clouds in the horizon. Besides, of course, the, the, of course, the demographic issue, which is a very big concern, of course. But besides that, the pension systems all in Europe are going bankrupt, all of them. Debt is very high. Growth in many countries is inexistent. In, in Austria, economic growth is like a zero. It's, it's pathetic. Entrepreneurship is com totally lacking. There are a lot of successful entre European entrepreneurs living in the U.S. In Silicon Valley, you find, for instance, many Austrians, you know, that are totally successful and, and great guys, you know, and, and, and very entrepreneurial. But they had to leave their homeland because in Austria, you know, th this idea... I know of one successful Austrian in California, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. <laughs> he was a governor <laughs> yeah. at some point. Yeah. And he plays... <laughs> He's quite a good actor. Successful in, yeah, in certain ways, yeah, <laughs> indeed. No, but you know, this idea, for the instance, of, of the company that starts in a garage, you know, like uh, Amazon, Apple. No, but this is like a legendary, That's totally impossible, legendary you know, so. cliche, you know, start your company in a garage. Right now you're living in a garage in the United States, <laughs> it's going back, you know, to your dentist Yeah, but in Austria, in, in Austria and in many countries in Europe, if you start a company in your garage, you will be, you will be put in jail. Because, because, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. It's, it's illegal. It's <laughs> literally illegal, so <laughs> that tells you something of the state of, of the state of entrepreneurship here. And that is something that, you know, and, 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 and all those issues are not not being tackled, are not being, are not being dealt with at all. In, well, we are in Poland now, and unfortunately here you had a fantastic system of private pension funds that was nationalized, and that, that to me, you know, I'm not an expert in, in Polish policy, but that, that to me is going to really hurt future pensioners, you know, of future pension, uh, Polish pension, pensioners, and that was very bad, and, and, and those things will have... To, very bad consequences, you know. I think there's still time, you know, and, and but reforms have to be have to be promoted and have to be applied very soon. I think I know one guy in Chile who could help us with our pension system. And, well, Jose Piñera, by the way, he has been a speaker on the, at the roadshow many times. He's, he's he's great, and what he what he did, I mean, it's you you see, you know, in 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 in, in many developed industrialized countries, you know that you can see how the older pension systems are going bankrupt literally you can you can see exactly when they will be go they will they will go bankrupt chile's system is marvelous it's marvelous it's it's it. and thanks to you know the 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 free market policies applied thanks to you know private property and thanks to the go thanks to the government stepping down and not doing things it shouldn't do in the first place. A week ago, uh, I watched the Telediario, which is Spanish uh, daily news, and there was this interview of the guy who is right now in charge of the Socialist Party. I forgot his name. I'm sorry. I don't remember. I don't, I don't give a flying <clears throat> about it. So, this guy had a... Had a had Pedro a, Suarez, something like that. Yeah. Uh, Maybe. I, I don't really Pedro know. Pedro something, yeah. There is no place in my brain to, to store this message. You know, this yeah, like, I'm, right. I'm sorry. Pedro, Pedro Sanchez. Pedro Sanchez, exactly. Um, and he told that he's got a solution, a socialist solution for a pension system, that the state should um, force and, and raise the prices and raise the, pen, uh, raise the um, paychecks, mm -hmm. raise the minimum wage, raise right. all the wages. Yeah. Because once you raise the wages... Uh, the part that you pay for a pension system will also grow. It's just this percentage will be bigger. I, I think this gentleman and is this a genius. Is, 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 that's it. And it's like, and the, 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 the crowd was like, you know, whooping. It was like great response. Yes, finally someone solved this problem. How, how come did, nobody... How, how didn't we think about I it? I mean, yeah, come yeah. on. I mean, in Argentina, we have been doing that for <laughs> seven decades so far. And yeah, the, the results uh, are not... Unfortunately, there's something, you know, I don't know, probably a conspiracy, a right-wing conspiracy, that it's a... a neoliberal. A neoliberal, right yeah, that is, you know, you know, it's working against us because, you know, those... We are... We are um, we have applied all those recipes for many, many decades now and... 
it's not, not working. Not, <laughs> not long enough, not hard enough. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that was not the real socialism. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's what the Kirchner family would tell you. Exactly. exactly. We haven't even started yet. Come on. That's a, that's a th- No, it's very, I mean, it's very dangerous. On the other hand, I am quite optimistic, you know, for, you can see that Spain had... You know, four or five years ago, this Podemos party, which is like the, the Chavismo, the Venezuelan Chavismo of Europe, they seemed that they could get, you know, to the government. And now they... Locally, they, they won in Madrid and Barcelona. In Barce- Madrid and Barcelona, that's really amazing. Like huge places, come on. But now you can see how they are diluting even the, 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 the populist administration of Greece is really self-destructing. So, so you... I think there's, you know, I, I really think Spain has, you know, dodged the populist bullet. You know, of course, I mean, Mariano Rajoy is a, is a horrible <laughs> prime minister, but he's way better than than than, um, than Podemos. Um, Spain probably will go to a, a political reconfiguration, but you know, the risk of having really a populist, a literally populist Chav- Chavista. Uh, government I think it's, it's it's avoided that's a good news and the same in Greece I think they, they are holding elections this year or in 2019 I don't remember and I think there there's a chance a big chance that a more center right more pro market government could replace the current uh, CDS administration that would be also positive so you can see some in some countries populism is declining and, and that's good in some others unfortunately it's rising but, well. but, but, but I'm observing um, a pattern looking at the last I don't know 20, 15 or even, even more years that once the populist government is out and more pro-liberal I mean pro-market government steps in they are the one the ones who are blamed for all of the consequences of, 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 the, of the previous uh, cabinets and the previous governments. In Poland, for example, once we ended um, with, with communism, that, that was not a problem for people. The, the, the problematic was the, the, the next five, seven, six years, and right now those guys who are in charge um, at the very beginning of, of post-communist era, um, they are being blamed for everything. Not the corrupt system of the communism that led to that situation, but the guys who are trying, and in better or worse, to solve this problem and to, to straighten things up. And, and many times they, they did a lot of horrible things as well, basically. I wouldn't agree with all the decisions, but basically they are just, I don't know, you can blame them like 15%, but 85% is the system that they inherited. In, in the case, you know, of, 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 of Latin American populism, which I know better, I mean, you know, that's my, ex- my historical experience is Latin American populism. Yeah. What more or less my, my, my hypothesis to explain that is that, for instance, in the case of Perón, Perón, Argentina was in the, in, the, in the mid-40s had certain problems, but was still a very rich country. By the beginning of the 20th century, Argentina was among the 10 biggest economies in the world. I mean, it was at the level of Australia and Canada. That was the reality. The name of the country comes from silver. That, that was the reality of the, of the country. Uh, when Perón got into power in 1940, Perón was the last Argentinian ruler who didn't complain about the inheritance he received. In fact, he did exactly the opposite. For instance, he said that he went to the central bank of Argentina and he couldn't walk through the hallways because there was so much gold. That's a, Perón was also, you know... And we have to solve this trouble. <laughs> he did. That's, in, in that sense, yeah, he was... In, in that sense, he, he solved that problem. But the thing is that Peronism has been so, you know... A, so much engraved into the culture of the country. My, my, of course, you know, there's certain cultural features of, of, of Argentina that, you know, made us fertile soil for populism. But the other thing is that he got this very wealthy country and for four or five years, Argentina was a huge populist party. I mean, it was literally, I mean, he didn't come up with the idea of subsidies for dogs, but believe me, they were, they were very close, and they were giving free goodies to everybody all the time. This was totally unsustainable, and at one point, you know, reality caught up with this, with this situation, and in 1951, 1952, problems started arising. 
But the thing is that when these problems appear, they are denounced as a conspiracy by the, ol the oligarchy, always. the US, you know, Poland, whoever. You can, it doesn't matter who this, you know, faceless uh, conspirator is. But the thing is, but they can, they can, you know, the populist can say, hey, we did our reforms, so to speak, and you know, you see, they were, you, you saw it, it, they were working, you know, we were happier, we were giving it money, and, and, and now it's, the problem is the conspiracy, but they have this, you know, so-called golden age to refer to, these four or five years, you know, it's, 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 in a way I like to compare it like to heroin addi addiction, for some time it must be great, then you are totally destroyed, but for some time heroin, you know, consuming heroin must feel fantastic. This is the same. And that myth in Argentina, and in a way, that, that is the same that is happening in Venezuela right now. That myth, it's engraved in, the, in people's minds. And they really believe in that. And they think, oh, they, they, we finally have some sort of popular government. You know, they were doing things for the people. And then comes, you know, the US, the conspirators, the oligarchy, the banks, whoever, you know. But, you know, with that, the, the myth game, they can really last. And, you know, they, of course, when, when finally an, a new administration comes and has to deal with all the craziness they, they, they receive, immediately they are blamed as, ah, you see, now the right-wingers are there and you see what they are the doing. The detoxation is, is painful. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it hurts. Yeah. And that is, you know, that is that that, that was the logic of, of Latin American populism. That is what that is what that it was. Chavez did. I mean, Chavez instead of inheriting a rich country, he inherited an oil floating country and the best prices of oil ever. So really, it was a huge party. It's still today in Venezuela. A liter of gasoline is uh, less costly than a liter of water. That tells you how insane the country is. Unfortunately, now Venezuela is a humanitarian tragedy by now, and of course a dictatorship. Because populism never starts dictatorial and totalitarian, but given enough time, it will end up dictatorial yeah, and no, totalitarian. They, they don't have money to, to, to run this oil business. They have no money to the, the, refine the oils, and, and all the petroleos are just standing you know, empty. There so. are many areas that are completely not used now, yeah. but you know, well, the, the, the oil industry is totally, uh, has been totally nationalized, and well, these are the results. But they still have oil, and that unfortunately is very bad for Venezuela because really this, there will always be a states, you know, we all know who they are, and there will always be, you know, people interested in backing a government like Maduro's because, you know, they have oil and they can be a good partner. So that's, that's very, very bad. And many people, many, many people, many talented people and many, you know, people who have studied and professionals have already left Venezuela. That's also very sad. The brain drain of Venezuela is huge. So the, the prospects of the country are, are complicated. On the other hand, the country is a complete, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it only needs, you know, a spark to, to, to start the fire. But because... The, the situation, people are dying of hunger. I mean, this is not a joke. In 2016, Venezuela's, Venezuelans on average lost seven kilos per capita. Every Venezuelan you see, uh, it's, it's thinner than, than they used to be, and, and not because, you know, they have a, an obsession to become thin. No, no, it's, they are literally not eating properly. The situation is horrible. Children fed at, at schools because they, they are not properly fed, uh, child mortality skyrocketed, mother Energy mortality skyrocketed. In, in hospitals skyrocketed. And, and, you, know, you, you get like 4,000% inflation last year. A, a country that floats on oil. Exactly. And this is this has nothing to do with the oil the oil prices. I always I have given a couple of talks about Venezuela because it's a very it's important for me because of course it's a, it's like to me it's, you know Venezuela is like a sister of Argentina you know and, and 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 we really care about it and also because it's unfortunately a current day you know a failure of socialism because now we don't have to talk about the Soviet Union that fell in 1989 now we talk about Venezuela this being destroyed today by socialism and when Chavez got into power in 1999 the barrel of oil was close to nine dollars. 
from that point, if we put 1999 as the ER0 of the revolution, so let's say, the price of oil has nothing but go up, but going up. At points, it was 15 times the, the price of the ER0. At points, was for four years in a row, it was 12 times. It was around, you know, 120, 100, 110, 120. And now that we have so-called so -called cheap oil, it's around 50, which is six, close to six times what it was when Chavez got into power. So let's not say this is the oil prices. And on the other hand, you see Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the Emirates, and they are not totally collapsing. And they are as dependent as, uh, uh, from oil as Venezuela. And they are not. This is not all the, all the, the, the price of oil. The price of oil is fantastic for Venezuela. Even today, is fantastic, and it's six times what it was in at the at the at the, at the early 2000s. The problem is the socialist policies. That's the real problem. You know, the, the Saudi Arabia just introduced the value-added tax because they want to diversify. And how would <laughs> tax is, diversity? I don't know. Because we only take our, you know, income from oil. Right now, we, we're going to tax people. That's very good. Yeah, they, could start, <laughs> they could start enslaving people as well. Exactly. That, they, they, that would you know, a third of, of the population would be slaves, and that's a... Huge uh, diversification. Yeah, they want to diversify source of income for the state. That's, uh, that's like very good. Slave domestic product. <laughs> like an, another... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, put into your that's, that's very sad. That's very, very sad. But in any case, really, what, what's, what we see in Venezuela is a huge tragedy. There's a, an economist, I follow uh, his work on Venezuela. He's Venezuelan by origin, by working in Harvard. Um, Ricardo Hausmann, he's very good. And he has done a, he's doing a magnificent job showing what's going on. By the way, thanks to Hausmann, I realized that the... The, the, the fall of the economy in Venezuela in the last four years has been worse than the fall of the economy of the U.S. during the Great Depression in the 1930s, and even worse than Russia's after the collapse of communism. The only th the only countries that are uh, have had worse, you know, uh, collapses of their economy. Are, I believe Rwanda, after you know the, 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 the massacre, genocidal thing that happened there, and a couple more, and that's it. The level of the tragedy, the economic tragedy of Venezuela, is unprecedented in Latin America. And believe me, we have had huge crises. Argentina, you know, I, I know it firsthand. And this is the worst Latin American crisis ever. And Ricardo Hausmann, and I'm not saying I agree, but he's an economist and he's a serious scholar, and he published an article at a Project Syndicate saying that there should be a military intervention in Venezuela. That's the only way to save the country. And I'm not saying I agree, and, you know, I tend to disagree with any... So this is worse than Alenda, this is worse this, than Chile. But the, that's the thing, because it's not only the hunger and the humanitarian tragedy, it's also the dictatorship. In Venezuela, the elections are completely fake. They, well, the, today I think they will announce the, 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 the date of the fake elections they are running for president which no one can participate. The last elections that were won by the opposition, uh, parliamentary elections, the government closed the parliament and created a, and, and ran a fake constitutional uh, referendum election that they, win, they won like with 90%. And now this constitutional assembly, which is completely fraudulent, is running the country. That's the situation. So, I mean, Hausmann was saying this is hunger, humanitarian crisis, plus totalitarianism. There's no way out but a military intervention. I don't agree in principle with any military interventions, but this is a great, you know, a great metaphor, a great way to understand what's going on there, that you have serious economists and people asking, saying, hey, the only way is that Latin American countries and the U.S. should, gather, should raise an army, you know, and, and, and invade my country. That's the situation. Mauricio Macri is some kind of hope to that situation. Do you believe that this guy can... His... his is that is a symbolic end of this Kirchner era, you yeah. can say, right? No, he's... I mean, there are two... two ways to... Just before, regarding Venezuela, Macri is doing the right thing. He's... Uh, applying all the diplomatic pressure we can uh, apply. We should, uh, uh, the only thing uh, Macri should do now uh, that he hasn't done, 
we should grant citizenship to every Venezuelan who wants to come to Argentina, literally. I would, because they are, I mean, really, they, they come to Argentina and they think it's paradise. And believe me, not because Argentina is an actual paradise, just because, you know, you go to the supermarket, there are, there's stuff there. Whoa, so, really? Uh, they, <laughs> Venezuelans are emigrating like crazy uh -huh. because of their countries. And, and we should, I mean, we should, Argentina has always been a country of immigrants, you know, we you, mostly from, from Europe because it was a, an almost empty country in the in the 18th century and we should grant and Venezuela is a country that it's you know related to us in many ways we should grant uh, citizenship to every Venezuelan who wants to come and they come and they can go on with their lives at least you know in a more normal way but besides that he's doing everything he can to help and they are also util uh, trying to use this you know the the, the the organization of American states and, you know, these diplomatic ins institutions. The problem is that maybe it's too late. That's not Macri's fault. I mean, he, he got into office a couple of years ago. But um, he's trying to do the right thing, definitely, regarding Venezuela. But there's no help from the Pope, as much as I've heard. That's very... That, that's the funny thing, because Pope treats... Um, the anti-communists in, in, in Venezuela, just the way the Polish Pope has been treating communists in Poland 30 it's, years no, ago. It's very, you know, when Bergoglio was elected Pope, I am a Catholic myself, I'm a bad Catholic, you know, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. When Bergoglio was elected Pope, I was very happy. I couldn't believe it, I remember it, because if no, nobody, everybody thought he would be elected Pope when they elected Ratzinger, mm -hmm. and well, didn't, that didn't happen, and nobody, you know, he wasn't mentioned as candidate or anything, you know, when, 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 when the conclave happened, and when he was elected, I really couldn't believe it, and it was very funny, at that point, Christina Kirchner was still in office, I, I think he was elected in 2013, uh, she was still in office, and immediately, all her, you know, associates, so to speak, started bashing Bergoglio, accusing him of things he never did, really, but, you know, they accuse him of anything. Every crime that has happened, he was accused, you know, completely falsely. And one of them, of, of, of Christina's associates, said that Bergoglio was elected like Voitila was elected, you know, in the 80s, to do exactly like the same thing. Voitila was like the anti-communist pope, and uh, Bergoglio would be the anti-populist pope. And I was thinking, yes, I hope so. And it's very, it's very sad, because in, in Argentina, when he was our cardinal, he played a very important institutional role, and I will be uh, uh, I, I will be thankful all my life to him because of this. Because at one point the Kirchners were basically all powerful, and one of the uh, very few checks and balances that they had, which was you know a more symbolic check and check and balance, but, but was was uh, Bergoglio and the in the Catholic Church, and they really helped. Cristina not to become, you know, a new Chavez. They were one of the few forces they had ag against, she had against her. So I'm very uh, shocked and, you know, unpleasantly surprised that of this turn that he has taken. And now he's literally, the, he's literally the populist pope. And I'm very sad, you know, when I see, you know, here in Warsaw some statues, you know, of, 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 of John Paul II, who was a great pope, not only, you know, for, for his anti-communist uh, fight. And I think that we have an Argentinian pope and he could have been our John Paul II and unfortunately he's, he has become exactly the opposite. It's, it's, it's really very sad. Can you think about any other connections between Argentina and Poland right now, except you being here today? <laughs> well, that's the most important connection, of definitely. Course. No, ma, there are there are a, there are several if you if you think about it. The first one and, and, and most important, I would say, is that Argentina has still, you know, a, a very important Polish community. Argentina, like I told you, is a country of immigrants, and. and in the late 18, uh, 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, Argentina was populated by, by people coming from Europe. Uh, 
most of the people who came, of course, were from Italy and Spain. Those that, that, that are our main, you know, immigrant waves. But people from other parts of Europe came as well. Wales, you know, Scotland, uh, France, Germany, and Poland. And there's a, there's a vibrant Polish community in, 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 in the city I'm from, in Argentina, in Rosario. And that's still, a, I think, a, a connection between the two countries. And the other connection, you know, now that comes to my mind is that in... In the late, very late 70s or early 80s, both Argentina and Chile had military dictatorships, and there was a controversy regarding a, a certain um, channel, the Beagle Channel, in the very south of Argentina and Chile, and who the, those islands belonged, either Chile or Argentina. And the countries were very, very close to go to war because of that controversy. And the war was avoided thanks to John Paul II. So John Paul II saved us <laughs> from going to war to Chile. Yeah, so those are the, yeah, I would say the, the biggest connections that I can come up with. But there's still really a vibrant Polish community in, in Argentina. We haven't mentioned... One more famous Argentinian, worldwide famous. I, I guess you already know what I'm referring to. So what was the situation on the front of anti-che battle? I, I started in 2004 an organization named Bases, Fundación Bases. We do several things and we are based in Rosario. Everything to promote you know, liber classical liberalism. And Rosario, unfortunately, is also the birthplace of Che Guevara. Many people think that he was Cuban because, I mean, he, but, you know, he was, he was from Argentina. He was basically just born in Rosario. This is very important, and you, I'll tell you why in a second. His family, he came from a, you know, a, a relatively wealthy family, but he was from the impoverished side of the, of the family, and, and, and they were traveling... And when Che was born, they were, you know, in, in Rosario. They, in, in, che spent only one year of his life in Rosario. You know, just from he was born until he was one, and then they left. I think they established themselves in Cordoba, which is like in the center of the country. But he just lived one year in Rosario being a baby. That was it. At the beginning of, the, of this 21st century, in, in Rosario, we... There, well, in Argentina there was all this populist wave and we had a socialist administration the socialist party is uh, running the city doing a very poor job unfortunately also but, and, all this, yeah, and all this you know Che Guevara industry started totally run by the state totally the, so they started creating you know there's basically nothing of Che Guevara in Rosario because he was only he only lived there one year. And, and Che Guevara didn't do anything in Argentina, thank God, I mean, because he would have killed a lot of people. <laughs> so there was nothing. So they started creating all this. The only thing that there is, it's the, 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 the house in which he lived, that's it, which is not a museum or anything, thank God. But they started creating, you know, a cultural center, Che Guevara. I mean, what... Che Guevara, we all know, was in favor of re-education, but of real education he wasn't, you know, in favor. So, I mean, he has nothing to do with culture. And the worst thing they did, they erected a statue, which is horrible, by the way, the statue is horrible, in a public square. So last year was not only the anniversary of the Red Revolution, but also the 50th anniversary of Che Guevara's death. So we thought it was a fantastic way to putting a human face or semi-human face, you know, because Che Guevara wasn't that human, uh, to, co to the crimes of communism. So we wanted to talk about the crimes of communism being the anniversary, you know, the 100th anniversary. But also it was a very good way to reach people who, if we started talking about, you know, the crimes, you know, in Ukraine in the 30s, which were horrible, you know, or the crimes in Poland or... You know, it's too far, too long ago. It's a, it's a, this list is very long. So this was great, you know, to say, hey, this guy who has a statue here, he was a criminal. He killed lots of homosexuals. He opened the first concentration camp in Cuba. You know, his... And the reaction we got from our campaign was amazing. And I was very optimistic. But I, 
not even in my wildest optimistic dreams I, I expected to have such a reaction. We had to. We wanted to run a different campaign, which images in in in, in public screen screens in, in in Rosario. We had everything prepared, but the owners of the public screens, you know, <laughs> backed down because they were afraid that the screens could be, you know, vandalized. So, when when we were about to launch the campaign, we had to change because we couldn't do what we were supposed to do. So we, we, we said, okay, we are doing, we are going to do it only, you know, uh, social networks online. We, of course, we wanted to do it online too, but we wanted to be present in the city physically, but we couldn't. And we, we started a petition, which is not very common in, in, in Argentina, but we started it also. The petition is now, I think, close to 22,000 signatures. The counter petition, which was started by a by basically all the leftist groups in Argentina has now no, no, no organizer and has less than a third of the signatures that we have. So that tells you more or less. And the other thing is that we really hit a nerve clearly. So we were, we were interviewed by The Economist, by BBC, by all the major newspapers and media in, in Argentina and in Latin America. And that gave me a, a very interesting, you know, way of measure the, the reaction of the people. Because, you know, most of these newspapers, for instance, have online versions, of course, and the comments are opened. And again, there, you could see that 70% of the people were totally on board with us, and 30% were critical, in different ways of being critical, but they were critical. And I really think that is a, re that is a reflection of, of course, it's not a scientific opinion, but I think that is a reflection of something deeper that is happening in Argentina. I think in Argentina we are now in the way of making a 70% of the population a stable base for non-populism, more rationality, and becoming and, 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 and going in the way of becoming Argentina a normal country. And that's very positive. I think Peronism, which is our cancer, literally, is dying. I think populism in Argentina is dying. I think Macri, which is doing the right thing in many ways, is just, um, is just you know, an expression of, some, of, of something way deeper that is happening in the society. I think Macri is a bottom-up, you know, phenomenon. And I really believe that Argentina is abandoning populism. So that makes me very, very optimistic for the future. And, and in part, that is why for the last four years, I, was, I have always been involved with buses and I have always traveled to Argentina since I was living in Europe. But uh, since I, I, I did not quit my job at the Ocean Economic Center, but I'm working less for them, less hours and remotely, because I wanted to be more in charge of my, of my time. I'll be working uh, much more hours for buses. I really think that it, now is the time to promote classical liberalism in Argentina. I think there's many people who want to hear what we are, what we are saying. And I want to be, and I really think Argentina is changing. I want to, you know, do put all my efforts to help in that change. You know, of course, it's not that buses alone is going to do this, but everything we can do, I, I want to do it. And, and it was, you know, a, it's a very big bet, but I, I'm very happy, and, and, and I'll be much more in, in Argentina and much more committed to to the country. And I really think. I really think things are, are, are changing in the in the correct direction, and, and, and that's very good. And um, we, unfortunately, we can't claim we are very clever because it took us seven decades, literally. But well, it's better late than never. Better late than never. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to host you here on my show. Uh, I hope you enjoy your stay in Poland. Hope to see you soon. Now, are you coming for the free market road show in Poland? I hope I'll, I'll be here. The problem is that. We run parallel tours, and I don't know in which part of the tour I will be. I hope I'm here, but I don't know yet. But anyway, everybody's invited. Every, all the information of the Free Market Roadshow can be found at 
freemarketroadshow.com or freemarket-rs.com. It's a fantastic event and all the events are for free and everybody should, all, all your listeners, if they are in any city in Europe, there's a, there's a very big chance that they will have a free market roadshow clo event close to them. So they should check, check us out and enroll. To listen again, press one. Hola, soy Federico Fernández y estás escuchando el podcast de Agente Thomas.